if we mess it up, there's not a lot of recovery. These programs are uh, over the top in their rules and regulations, but they had nothing with carbon fiber. So we had to go out and, uh, and work on that. And one of the things I learned is, you know, when you're outside the box, it's really hard to tell how far outside the box you really are. Last week, I was very shocked and upset to find out about the Ocean Gate Titan submersible disaster, as I'm sure many of you were. And yesterday, we saw some of the first pieces of wreckage being recovered from the sea floor. With my background in composites, I started digging a little bit deeper into the construction of the Titan, and I didn't like what I saw. In this video, I'd like to look at a few aspects of the Titan submersible design, which I believe could have caused its failure. I've got to be honest with you here, I'm not a naval architect nor a structural engineer, but I do have over 10 years of experience with carbon composites, and I've even bonded titanium to carbon before. Whilst it's now become clear the Titan had many other issues, such as communications and electronic faults, it's highly probable that it's a composites engineering problem which actually brought the sub down. Firstly, let's look at the design and manufacture of the carbon fibre hull and how perhaps the Ocean Gate engineers vastly overestimated its strength and durability. We will then have a close look at the bond between the carbon fibre hull and the titanium interface cap which connected to the dome and why it was likely doomed to fail. Uh, and we were pretty far out there. So we have a, a carbon fiber hull, it's five inches thick, uh, and titanium uh, domes on the end. Uh, there's 667 layers of carbon fiber uh, in just a, what's called a 0-90 uh, axial and um, um, uh, rotational uh, layout, which is not normally done. But in the ocean, that's all you see. You don't get any torsional moments. So we've just heard the late CEO Stockton Rush tell us that there are a monumental 667 layers of carbon in this hull. He also goes on to tell us that the carbon is going in one single orientation and that no other orientations need be considered because the hull doesn't come under any torsional loading. Whilst I agree with Stockton's last statement there about the submersible not coming under any torsional moments, I would strongly argue that adding other axes to the composite layup such as 0, 90 degrees, 45s, 65s, etc. would make the submersible hull way more durable. In my opinion, adding multiple axes to the carbon fibre pressure hull would slow down all the classic failure mechanisms you usually find in carbon composites. I think the two most likely causes of failure in the pressure hull were due to kink bands under repeated compressive loads and cone of fracture under repeated impacts. I think if they'd used multiple axes of carbon filament on the pressure hull, things like the kink bands and fractures and delaminations and little micro cracks wouldn't have been able to propagate so fast and so catastrophically. In the next clip, you actually hear Stockton describing the terrifying noises of these failure mechanisms taking place in the carbon composite hull as he's diving down in one of the earlier prototypes. We made one hull, uh, I took it to 4,000 meters, um, uh, and it made a lot of noise, which is a very sphincter tightening experience. And it wasn't getting quieter on the second dive, it should have been dramatically quieter. If you think about it, when you get to this uh, maximum pressure, it's a thing called the Kaiser effect, you get a lot of popping and crackling, and the next time you go to that pressure, you should have a lot less. All those weak fibers and voids have all been taken care of. The fact that Stockton is admitting there were voids and weak fibers in the pressure hull perhaps highlights why carbon isn't the right material for this job. For example, if you took steel, aluminium, titanium or acrylic, their internal structures would be far more homogeneous and free of voids and would be way better suited to these repeated compressive loads that you find at 4,000 meters below the sea. That being said, I think carbon fibre could make a very successful pressure hull. You would just need to do far more R&D, destructive tests and non-destructive tests. And I think it would probably look a lot more like this. Carbon fibre is three times better on a strength to buoyancy basis than titanium. And underwater, that's what you care about. It's not strength to weight, it's strength to buoyancy. We hear Stockton justifying his use of carbon fibre for the pressure hull here. Uh, under the metric of strength to buoyancy ratio and I wonder if it would be interesting to hear from a naval architect whether this is actually a metric that's used when designing submersibles. Now we're going to have a close look at the bond between the carbon fibre pressure hull and the titanium interface cap. Now this cap is a titanium interface between the hull and the hemispherical door which is bolted closed. It was really quite shocking yesterday to see the interface cap being recovered from the seabed 
without a shred of the carbon pressure hull bonded to it, which can only mean that there was a complete failure of bonding between the two materials. Now it could be that the sheer power of the shockwave when the hull imploded just blew the end caps off clean and that's why we're not seeing any carbon. However, I think if we look at some of the footage of them actually bonding it on, we can see quite a lot of red flags and rookie errors when bonding titanium to carbon. Between the two components, um, really what's holding them together and allowing them to move together is the glue. And so you want nice, even um, movement. It's the glue that's holding the family together and we want to make sure it's right. Now before we look at the glue itself, let's take a second to just be absolutely shocked at how this technician is cleaning the titanium component prior to bonding. In his right hand we observe a dirty rag which he appears to be degreasing with while simultaneously touching the component again afterwards with his ungloved left hand. It's a huge no-no to touch composite components prior to bonding with your bare hands because you can introduce grease from your bare hands onto the part which is going to really sabotage the bond, especially when bonding dissimilar materials like titanium and carbon fibre. Not to mention the fact there's probably harmful solvents being used as degreasing agents, which you don't really want on your bare skin anyway. Now if I was going to bond these two parts together, I would want this to be done in a clean room environment with a temperature and humidity controlled workshop. I'd want nitrile gloves, full Tyvek suit to prevent any human hair, dust, humidity, grease, etc. getting onto the parts that are going to be bonded. It's pretty wild to see an assembly of this magnitude and probably cost being assembled by a couple of guys in no better than aprons with little tiny gloves on or in fact no gloves at all. The glue is very thick, so it's not like Elmer's glue, it's like uh, peanut butter. Here we can see one of the technicians actually hand mixing what's described as a very thick glue to bond the hull to the interface cap. Now we can see he's mixing it by hand with a wooden spatula. And there's nothing wrong really with mixing stuff by hand, except that you can actually introduce air bubbles to the glue. And this strikes me as a problem if your cured glue between the two parts was full of air bubbles and then could actually crush, which would destroy the bond. I mean, let's think about this. The titanium interface cap is pushing against the carbon hull at 6,000 PSI when it's down at these levels. And so I'm not sure if the so-called flexible bond is really going to stay flexible if it's full of air bubbles. If we listen carefully, we can also hear one of the technicians mention that there's ceramic fiber in the glue. And one if this has been added afterwards or if it's something that they've purchased because the ceramic fiber, if not mixed homogeneously, could end up in pockets and create kind of dry zones around the bond. I'd also want to know, had they thickened the glue with a thickening agent such as collodial silica, which is often used to thicken up a glue for these sorts of applications where you don't want the glue to run off your part when you're bonding. I may be completely wrong here, but we've potentially got two extra agents added to the glue, which is a ceramic fibre and possibly a thickening agent to stop the glue slumping off the part. Um, both are going to introduce air bubbles to the part, uh, if not degassed, and really deteriorate the bond over time and under pressure. This clip shows how you disperse carbon nanotubes, um, graphene, graphite, things like that into epoxy resins properly by using an ultrasonic wand and a mixer. Of course, I could be completely wrong on OceanGate, might actually just be using an off-the-shelf glue that's grey, but the colour does make me think that they've perhaps added some kind of graphite or graphene powder into their home brew. Perhaps this is what they mean when they're talking about um, ceramic fibre, the addition of graphene, graphite or carbon nanotubes to the resin matrix in order to increase the mechanical strength of the bond. Um, whilst this is very clever, uh, you must know exactly how to disperse the carbon nanotubes as we see in this video and also need to be careful to adjust the right amount of said fibres whilst a small amount will actually increase the mechanical strength of the bond and the flexural strength, adding too much will then go backwards and make the flexural strength reduced. Another thing that was quite alarming when they dropped the interface cap onto the carbon hull, we didn't see any glue squeeze out of the gap. This leads me to believe perhaps they hadn't used enough glue in the first place. It be the deepest diving carbon fiber sub ever built. If I was bonding two components like this, I'd probably want to use a product a little bit like this Permabond, where it has an actual mixing nozzle that gets the mixing ratios absolutely spot on when you're getting it onto the part. 
maybe a sixteenth to a thirty seconds inch layer after we smooth it all out and then once we put it together and clamp it down we want a little bit to squish out of the edges now if you want to bond two dissimilar materials together like carbon fiber and titanium you have to get a very special surface texture on the titanium component in order to accept the resin for it to key into the surface properly and bond the two components now this can be achieved by things like chemical etching, uh, probably ceramic coatings, uh, at the very least sandblasting the titanium component to give it that surface roughness. Now it's not readily obvious in the OceanGate video whether the titanium interface cap actually has any of these uh, surface textures. To me it looks like the interface cap sadly has an as machined finish straight off the lathe and has then been degreased by a man wearing no gloves. So now we're getting the first pieces of footage of wreckage being recovered from the Titan. I think it's safe to say that it failed catastrophically in two areas. The first being the manufacture of the carbon fibre pressure hull, which looked like, with its single orientation of carbon fibre, made it far more prone to things like buckling, kinking, delaminations and stress fractures. And then the interface between the titanium cap and the pressure hull, the bond looked a little bit dodgy, we saw some slightly dubious glue being mixed up, perhaps not even enough being applied, and was it even applied onto a special um, surface treatment on the titanium? We just won't know these things until the proper analysis has been carried out. But I think what's quite likely to have happened is that the repeated crushing of these voids in the carbon fiber pressure hull and the deformation of the pressure hull, a bit like squeezing a can of Pringles, um, has really just broken the bond between the interface cap and probably simultaneously the uh, pressure hull collapsed catastrophically and as we know carbon fiber is very brittle when it collapses um, whereas if you use perhaps a metal pressure hull it could have actually buckled and bent but actually stayed watertight and in this case it's water is obviously flooded in um, at an incredible rate and there's been an implosion which has basically blasted off those hemispheres sheared all of the bolts and uh, it's just been a complete disaster. And my thoughts, of course, are with the victims and the families at this time. Composites are amazing materials and may well have their place in submersible exploration in the future, but we've got to do a lot more R&D and not cut corners in terms of manufacture, design and testing.